Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We are in the amazingly classic poem, Crossing Brooklyn Ferry. We're going to take actually passage 3 and 4 together as a unit. We could, of course, separate them and give two different sets of comments to them, but I think it makes sense for us to look at this what some have called a snapshot in words. You'll remember that we say often to writers, show, don't tell. And we're going to see quite a bit of this here in this passage. I think we'll see that both of these passages go together. We will find in this set of uh, lines the just dot, 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 I construction. So go ahead and run, write that down. There's an identification with the past, the present, and the future. Now, many have argued that... Uh, crossing Brooklyn Ferry um, and, and Whitman standing there at the East River and, and, and watching everything that he's going to describe here, that really what he's doing is he's trying to capture some notion of this strange concept that we uh, call time. And uh, so we're going to play that game. Let's, uh, let's read now um, um, the, the uh, set of lines. And as we read, because there is a bit of length here, we'll go ahead and we will just annotate as we go. I want to point out that at the beginning of passage 3 and passage 4, we will play the game of vague antecedent, as we've talked about it in other lectures, especially in our Shakespeare study. In other words, we have a pronoun, but it's not always directly clear what we're talking about, and then it'll be made clear for us. It avails not time nor place, and then you, have the, you, then you have the dash that makes us think of Emily Dickinson. Of course, uh, we've seen this dash before. It avails not time nor place. Distance avails not, and then all of a sudden we start to get it. In other words, what we're really talking about is the, this notion of time, the distance between Whitman as he's writing this poem, and you and I as we are reading this poem together, as we are talking with, well, obviously, right? Now, just to remind, this, uh, this study for us assumes that you've been with us at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, Talks with Walt, and that you've already been with us um, uh, um, at LearnStrong.net through most of these early lectures that we've done, I hope maybe even all of them from inscriptions all the way up through Ferry uh, uh, Passage 2. It avails not time nor place. Distance avails not. By the way, we're going to see this again, put it in your notes, in Passage 5, the heart of the poem. I am, and we've talked about that construction of I am, that I am from, uh, from the biblical text. I am with you, you men and women of a generation, or ever so many generations. Hence, go back to passage 2 to talk about that, that his use of the word hence. And then we're going to get this um, construction uh, five times with this just, and then we'll have some words, and then I. Just as you feel when you look on the river and sky, so I felt just as any of you is one of a living crowd. We've heard the word crowd. Now it's a living crowd. I was one of a crowd. Just as you are refreshed by the gladness of the river and the bright flow, I was refreshed. And of course, this use of the river and flow makes us think of our Heraclitus, and you can't ever step into the same river twice. And of course, we're going to have Heraclitus quoted at the beginning of T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets for Norton, time present and time past, or both perhaps present and time future, and time future contained in time past. I'm thoroughly convinced that some of these lines are at the heart of our study and our reading of T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets, which we've talked about elsewhere at LearnStrong.net. Just as you stand and lean on the rail, yet hurry with the swift current, <clears throat> I stood, yet was hurried. Now, notice the movement between, on the one hand, fixity, and on the other hand, flow, movement, right? That is to say, hurry, or uh, uh, um, uh, moving on, right? I'd like to pause for a moment, though, and put this at 3A. At, 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 uh, I'd like you to go back and take a look at T.S. Eliot's Little Getting Part 2. I saw a man um, loitering and hurried. Um, that idea, how can you be both loitering and hurried? And I think T.S. Eliot borrowed it heavily from this set of lines right here. Just, now to finish with the fifth one, as you look on the numberless mass of ships and the thick steamed pipes of steamboats, I look. And I think, let's put it in our notes, this is to me one of the real keys to reading Whitman, is that he is a looker. He's curious, back to the opening lines of this poem. This is what great artists do. They see, but they see 
into the life of things, to quote Wordsworth's Ten Turn Abbey, that idea that the artist had this ability to see beyond the epidermis of the, or the surface of life. Now we're going to break, and we're going to get to a, pass, uh, to a construction that we're going to see more heavily in the heart of the poem in passage 5, I, too, and we'll immediately think of Langston Hughes' classic poem, I, too, I, too, uh, sing America. I, too, many and many a time, crossed the river of old. Now, it's such an interesting phrasing. The river of old makes us obviously think that we're speaking now in classical terms with our Dante and the like, as opposed to not just the East River, right? Watched the 12 month goals, seagulls. By the way, this 12th month is a, is a construction from the, from the Quaker language. Of course, Whitman very influenced by it. Oscillating, we're gonna get later shimmering, we're gonna get glistening. Watch all of these, all, all these uh, uh, verbs. Oscillating their bodies, these um, seagulls. And of course, the minute we think about birds, we think about flight, we think about freedom, and think about all the texts in 303 that we study that have to do with birds. We'll concentrate just to, uh, today on those romantics. You'll remember that Shelley will write uh, to a skylark, and then of course Keats's Nightingale will come to mind. And I think Nightingale is a central text here uh, that stands behind everything that we're reading in uh, Crossing Brooklyn Ferry. Um, He'll, he'll say it this way, watched the 12th month seagulls, saw them high in the air, floating with motionless wings, oscillating their bodies, and then we're going to get seven of these saw, saw, saw. Saw how the glistening yellow lit up parts of their bodies and left the rest in strong shadow. The artistic eye is remarkable here. Saw the slow wheeling circles, think about Emerson in his famous essay, Circles, and the gradual edging toward the south. Saw the reflection of the summer sky in the water, and this idea about circling, by the way, we're going to come back to in passage 9. Saw the reflection of the summer sky in the water, had my eyes dazzled, by the shimmering track of beams. Think about how he uses the word dazzled. You must have it yourself to, to the dazzle of the light uh, and of every moment of your life in Song of Myself, Passage 46. Had my eyes dazzled by the shimmering track of beams. And of course, that's a compelling image in itself. And you get a lot of these kind of images in, uh, in this passage that remind you of the ancient Renaissance, the old Renaissance paintings, where you're going to deify somebody with some kind of halo and lights uh, being attached with sunshine and the light, all being played here. Looked, now we're going to get four of these looked, looked, looks, and, no, and notice it is the, uh, the alighted verb. Looked at the fine centrifugal spokes of light round the shape of my head in the sunlit water. And we just mentioned that image, right? Centrifugal, by the way, Song of Myself, Passage 43, to go back to it again. Looked at the haze on the hill southward and southwestward. Looked on the vapor as it flew in fleeces. Hear the F sounds here. T tinged uh, with violet. Notice the great verbs that he uses here. Tinged with violet. Of course, color is so important, as we've said in earlier lectures, in Leaves of Grass, here it's violet. Look toward the lower bay to notice the vessels arriving. And now we're going to get a couple of saws. Saw their approach. Saw uh, uh, abroad those that were near me. Saw the white sails of schooners and sloops. Saw the ships at anchor. All of the referencing now to ships. The sailors at work in the rigging are out astride the spars. Can't help but think of T.S. Eliot's Dry Salvages as we read some of these lines. Go back and look at what we said about that at learnstrong.net. The round masks, the swinging motion of the holes, the slender serpentine pennants. We're going to see the serpentine again with um, um, cavalry crossing a ford, just to, uh, just to kind of set you up for it. The large and small steamers in motion, the pilots in their pilot houses, the white weight left by the passage, of course crossing right, the quick tremulous whirl of the wheels, this word whirl, whirl you'll remember it from Idolans. Um, uh, uh, America, uh, uh, Americans, he says about America, teeming in, uh, uh, in the world, go going, these echoes are always there. The flags of all nations, remember a uh, song of myself, Passage 6, the flag of my dispossession, uh, um, we're playing similar games with the, with the echoing here. The falling of them at sunset, the scalloped edged waves in the twilight, notice sunset and twilight, the ladle cups, the frolic some crests and glistening. The stretch afar, growing dimmer, 
and dimmer. We think of Keats's Nightingale here. The gray walls of the granite storehouses by the docks. Now we're going to begin to see the, the setting again brilliantly. Show, don't tell, right? Um, or, or, and then we're going to get a couple of on. On the river, the shadowy group, the big steam tug closely flanked on each side by the barges, the hay boat, the belated lighter, all the different kinds of boats. We're going to have, uh, we're, this will have, uh, you know, resonances for us in our study, for example, of Joseph Conrad. On the neighboring shore, the fires from the foundry chimneys burning high and glaringly into the night. We can obviously think about the environmental challenges of some of the things that were happening there in Brooklyn and elsewhere in New York during this time. Casting their flicker of black, contrasted with wild red and yellow light over the tops of houses and down into the clefts of streets. Uh, I just want to point out that this word contrasted has to be one of the central words, I think, in all of Leaves of Grass, because Whitman is always playing this game of contrasts, yes. So here the word contrast, notice we will have the contrast of man-made, human-made uh, phenomenon with, of course, the amazing light that will be a part of uh, sunset at this, at this point in time. Notice the use of the word clefts of streets. It's almost as if the, it's the, the city itself is constructing its own notion of the canyon that's happened there. And now we move from passage 3 to passage 4 because I think they do go together with this pronoun these. And then it's like, what's the antecedent? What are we talking about? Well, all these images. And all else were to me the same as they are to you. The more things change, the more they stay the same, and we're back to the beginning of passage 3, which is why we'll kind of put these together. And then he says, I loved well those cities. Notice he uses the plural. Loved well the stately and rapid river. So now he's obviously saying how much he, how much he loves the, the East River. The men and women I saw, back to earlier in passage 3, I saw were all near to me. Now, this construction is important, so write it down. It'll have double meaning. Not only is it near as in physical proximity, but Whitman wants to point out that he's near to them, both in his humanity and in his longing to, in some ways, connect with them. And not just them, but obviously, as he's about to say, with you. The poem now begins to move towards that fifth movement, the fifth passage, which will be the heart of the poem. The men and women I saw there, uh, I saw, were all near to me. Others, the same, notice the use of the dash again. Others who look back on me because I looked forward to them. It's a compelling line. Why is it that we love Walt Whitman so much? Well, from a poem like this, we have a sense that he, he somehow knew something. He understood something about the project that he would call Leaves of Grass that we can only begin to appreciate once we start actually reading and studying these poems. But somehow he knew it. Others, the same others who look back on me because I look forward to them. And then in parenthetics, we've seen this before from the inscriptions on. How every once in a while we'll get these kind of parenthetical fra um, um, phrases. The time will come. Uh-oh, here we go. Now he's starting to predict. The time will come, though I stop here, today and tonight. Now, what are we going to do with a set of lines like this? The time will come. Well, I think Whitman is very much, we'll go back to passage 2 and his use of the word hence, 50 years, 100 years or more. I think he's trying to tell us as readers, I knew all along that I was going to be able to speak to you about the beauties that I was witnessing. And to that degree, he will transcend, as all great artists will, time. And that kind of takes us, you know, to what it is that great artists do in 2A. Well, think about it. Often the commonplace is amazing, once you see it again. Go back to what we said about Shelley and his defense of poetry. You'll remember in our comments there at LearnStrong.net, we've given a full lecture on it. But do you remember he said, what great poets do is they have this ability to take the commonplace and make it somehow amazing again, right? We think about this in our reading of, for example, To a Skylark, the next time you hear the song of a bird, you're kind of like, oh yeah, they're blown away again. It, you see it again in a different way. How does a rainbow sound? Well, a song, the song of the songbird. Well, that's kind of a very strange way to think of it. And so this is what great poets do. As well, another major message here is that the future is contained right now in the present with the time will come fascinating lines. 
Of course, at 2B, we have all the anaphoria, which will give, to, uh, give rise to certain kinds of rhythms. Again, we talk about his use of pronouns and the way in which it's kind of a little bit unclear what the antecedent of those pronouns are, and yet it becomes kind of clear. At 3A, I mentioned Conrad, and I want to come to him now and say, Conrad and his descriptions, both in Lord Jim as well as in uh, Heart of Darkness, which we've spoken about uh, at length uh, at LearnStrong.net, I think uh, we'll, we'll see an artist in prose who's playing the same game that we will see with Whitman here in poetry. And then I mentioned T.S. Eliot. Just go back and read again Dry Salvages, the most American, we have often said, of the four of the four, of the four quartets. And, and uh, you can follow along with my lecture comments there to hear some of the resonances that are, that are going on. I think... Of all of the poems of Whitman, maybe Crossing Brooklyn Ferry is the one that most influenced T.S. Eliot, even though he always denied it. Finally, at 3B, how are we going to own something like this? Well, if you've spent any time around harbors, what is your favorite harbor scene? Because he's obviously trying to capture something like this. What is for you the best show-don't-tell writer? All right. I mean, who is it for you? Some of you will say it's a writer like Cormac McCarthy, maybe the greatest living writer who is able to do that. Some of you will say it's Faulkner. Some of you will uh, go to James Joyce, uh, Toni Morrison. I mean, who is the greatest writer for you with Show, Don't Tell? And what is for you the greatest Show, Don't Tell moment in all of Leaves of Grass? Obviously, we're looking at one here, but we got a whole bunch of them throughout Leaves of Grass. So what is it for you? We haven't even gotten the drum taps yet where some of the most amazing Show, Don't Tell passages will happen. Finally, what will the future look like when the future finally arrives? That is to say, what will it look like when, as to use the language, the time will come? How do you think about the future? What will America, for example, look like in 100, 200 years? I'm not asking whether you believe it will exist or not. That's kind of, those are kind of more silly political speculative questions. I mean, quite physically, what do you imagine, for example, your small town or the city that you live in will look like in the future? And from there, obviously, we move now to the opening uh, uh, lines of Passage 5, the heart of the poem, and some very interesting rhetorical questions. Thank you.